so glad you tuned in today to listen to Lighthouse Christian Church. Let us join the service currently in progress. All right, so we are moving forward. We're in Matthew chapter 4 now. As you'll recall, last couple of weeks, we covered the baptism of Jesus and how special that was with the Trinity right there present. Uh, we also covered last week uh, Christ, after his baptism, headed into the desert for 40 days and fasted. And at the very end of it, Satan came to him to tempt him in really serious ways, in three different ways. And Christ responded perfectly, of course, because he's Christ. And he's perfectly responding by responding with Scripture to everything Satan was trying to bait him with or deceive him with or offer to him as a temptation so that Christ would not worship the Father. He would worship Satan. So we talked about that last week and we saw this beautiful example of Christ responding with Scripture in an appropriate way, in a powerful way, against these temptations and these tests of the enemy. We have the same ability in our lives to respond the same way if we know our Scripture. We need to know our Scripture in order to be able to respond with Scripture. And so if we haven't memorized this whole book, raise your hand if you've memorized the whole thing. Go ahead. I dare you. We'll find something you don't know. But if you don't know the whole book, keep the book with you. How about that? That'll work. I keep I keep a Bible in my car. I keep a Bible wherever I go. I got probably three in my office. I got 40 at home. I've got Bibles around and I've got it on my phone now, too, just in case I get separated from my car, my work, my home. So you could have the Bible wherever you go. Isn't that extraordinary? It's awesome. And it's a weapon that we use to get through life because there's going to be temptations. There's going to be tests. There's going to be all kinds of challenges, but we have the perfect weapon to respond with. Now, carrying the Bible, having it on our phone, is no replacement for actually memorizing it. Because when you memorize it, when you meditate on it, then it's going to go deep. Then it's when something happens, it triggers Scripture as a response. How often has that happened for you? I know it happens for me. Something happens... And I say, oh, my goodness. It's like this week when people were saying, hey, Jerry, what happened to you when they see this this mark on my face? Did you lose a bar fight? I said, why would you think I'm in a bar? Why would you think I'm in a fight? Why would you think I'm in a bar fight? And last, why do you think I would lose? But, well, that's all humorous. But the real answer is if I lost a fight, it's because I was instructed to turn the other cheek. So Scripture can help us in so many regards. I'm making light of it, but I shouldn't because it is a powerful weapon. But as we know Scripture, there are things when people will come and share with me something that they've gone through that's really tough, and then all of a sudden they're ministering in a next season to someone else out of the very thing that God did in their life to comfort them It reminds me of Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where it's talking about we can comfort those with the comfort that we have received through the Holy Spirit. These things come to mind when circumstances emerge. So memorizing our Scripture, meditating on our Scripture is so, so important. So that's why we encourage it, and that's why we do it ourselves, and uh, it's, it's profitable in every regard. So... This morning, now we're moving forward into Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 to 25. And this is where Jesus now, after his baptism, and he's been identified by God himself, the Father and the Holy Spirit, as the one. And now he's been tested in the desert, and he's had this really precious private time with the Father. And now he's tested. Now he's ready to start his earthly ministry And it's so fascinating as to how he approaches it. And as we look into this, and as we look into all of Scripture, I always want to remind us to look for God's plan that keeps unfolding. There was a plan of salvation that's there in the very beginning of Genesis that unfolds once we get to the Gospels. And we see that this Messiah had to come, he did come, and he gave his life for us. This is pursuant to a plan. God always has a plan. Scripture says that the plans that he has for us 
are good plans to profit us, not to hurt us, as it's recorded in Jeremiah. So God has plans. His plan for Jesus was after the baptism, after the testing in the desert, now it would be the kickoff to his earthly ministry, which lasted three years before the time, the appointed time came for him to give his life for all of us and everyone who would ever call on his name. So, so how does he start this earthly ministry? Our first point is he starts it by preaching the good news. First thing he does is he preaches the good news. But let's read our verses. Matthew 4.12 says, When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. So he's baptized by John. He goes into the desert for 40 days, tested. He comes out of the desert and he gets word that John the Baptist had been put in prison. So what did Jesus do? He actually withdrew over here to Galilee, right? Matthew 4, 13 and 14 says, Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. So we see the fulfillment of prophecy, even as how Jesus moved through his life. Matthew 4, 15 and 16 records it this way. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. So Christ, in accordance with Scripture, in accordance with prophecy, moves at the appointed times from here to there. God has specific purposes in His life, just like He does for you and me, wherever we're planted and wherever He takes us. He's in control. He has a plan. And this was the plan for Jesus. It wasn't to begin this earthly ministry right there in Jerusalem. God had important reasons for that. He brought him back to Galilee. He brought him back to an area where there were a lot of Gentiles, interestingly enough, even though Jesus is also the king of the Jews and was called first to come to Israel, he's in Galilee and he is actually sharing the gospel with many. And it's not just the Jews. It's interesting how God positioned him. But here's the key. Matthew 4.17 says, from that time on, from the time that he left and came up to Galilee and he left Nazareth and went to Capernaum and we know it's specifically where he is, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. John was preaching about repentance, pointing people, preparing people for the Christ, the Messiah, the one who would come. The one who would come is now here. John baptized him. John's now in prison. Jesus now is released to preach the good news. And it's such a different message than has ever been heard on this planet. It's consistent with prophecies of old. It's consistent with what God was saying in the Old Testament about being truly uh, a God who would be a God of redemption, who would bring about healing and he'd bring about eternity and eternal life. These things were now unfolding. But Jesus, notice, he didn't go into the synagogues and somehow start preaching there. He's just out. And he's not invited maybe into the synagogues, but he's out and he's got this new message and he's preaching not just repentance, but repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven has come near. And that's in the person of Jesus Christ. So the first thing that Jesus does in his earthly ministry is start to preach the good news. This is huge. It's what we're called to do in our lives is to preach the good news, teach the good news, share the good news. Fulfill the Great Commission. We're all called to share Jesus Christ with others because if they never come to know Jesus Christ, then they've missed out on everything. Not a little. Everything in eternity that God really had in store for them. So this is what we preach. This is what Jesus preached was the good news. Now the second thing, the second thing is Jesus then begins to call his first disciples. This is our second point. 
In Matthew 4.18, it says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. First two called by Jesus in accordance with the Gospel of Matthew and the other Gospels was actually Simon Peter, the one who would be called Peter, and his brother Andrew. And they were simply fishing. And Jesus appears to them. And what does he say? Matthew 4.19 says, Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. He's going to completely change their lives. These are fishermen. This is their livelihood. This is what they do on a daily basis for their family and to generate income for what their needs were. And Jesus simply tells them, come follow me and I will send you out to be fishers of men. It's beautiful. It's simple. And Matthew 4.20 says, at once they left their nets and followed him. At once it wasn't, let's talk this over with mom and dad. Let's talk this over with spouses. Let's talk this over with anybody else. They knew that they needed to respond, and they responded immediately. It's so important at times when God touches us on the shoulder that we respond at once. I really love this, at once. There's times that God has t- touched me on the shoulder and says, hey, I want you engaged over here, and I didn't respond. And that was a mistake. It's, he really wanted me to do it, and I was being disobedient and not doing it. And God, when He taps us, when He prompts us, He wants us to move now. He doesn't want us to wait and move later. He actually wants us to move now. If they had not responded, they wouldn't be disciples. They wouldn't be apostles. God knew they would respond, but they did respond Elsewhere in Scripture, um, Jesus is talking to other others who are following Him and listening to His teaching and so forth. And He's telling people to come and follow Him. And one, one gentleman says, no, I need to go bury my father. And Jesus responds. He says, no, follow me. Follow me. This might seem important to you, but you need to follow me. This is more important. He said, let the dead bury the dead. Wow, it seems pretty harsh. This is his father. He wants to honor his father. But when Christ prompts you, when the Holy Spirit prompts you, it's the most important thing that's happening. And you need to respond to that prompt. Peter and his brother Andrew did. And then Jesus goes on. We'll read in the next verses. And the next disciples he calls are James and John. The brothers James and John. So in these first encounters, People respond at once and they come. They know there's something hugely special and significant. So they just follow the prompting and they go. And of these four, three actually end up being the closest to Christ. We know this from how he interacted with them, from how they referred to themselves, how John referred to himself for sure but also because they were with Christ in the Mount of Transfiguration that we talked about a couple of weeks ago when Christ went up and and they went up and then they saw him in his glory. They were privileged to many things, but they they were three of the first disciples who were called. But it's significant that as Jesus, with all this authority, even power, still had purposed in God's plan to engage other people who would be aligned with him, who would be on his team, who would be the ones who he would empower and engage them by training them day in and day out, living together, seeing, not just hearing the teaching, not just seeing the miracles, but seeing how he lived every moment virtually of every day. They were with him. They left the fishing and went to be with him and did not return to it. They went to be with Christ, and they got to know Him so well. And it's because of that training also, and because of the anointing on their lives, they then became the apostles after His death and resurrection, who were essential and foundational in sharing the gospel message and and, and 
creating the early church. God had a plan. And that, that plan involves others. That plan today involves you and me. You're part of a really big, awesome plan that's unfolding minute by minute, day by day. Never lose sight of that. No matter what problems and challenges you have, no matter what's going right, what's going wrong, never lose sight of the fact that you are part of God's plan and He has specifically created you to worship Him, to bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ, to share the gospel, and to do good in this life, to bless the Lord and to bless others. And he has specificity to his plan in your life. There's specificity here. These things didn't happen haphazardly. It was part of a plan. Okay, now the time has come where I'm going to go out and share this awesome news that the kingdom of God has come near. You need to repent. And then Jesus, we know, was going to lay down his very life so that people could have life. But he decided early on to engage others to be a part of this ongoing mission to bring others into God's kingdom. It's an extraordinary plan. He didn't go to the best and the brightest at the time. He just didn't. He went to people who were pretty ordinary from all accounts. Fishermen. Not the politicians, not the leaders, not the rulers. It was quite the opposite. He could have done that. He didn't. In his wisdom, in his perfection, his plan was to use people like you and me. And he's still doing it. It's incredible. And it's successful. You think about how many people have come to know about Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in the last 2,000 years. It's staggering. There's still some who have not accepted him. There's still some who perhaps have not heard of him, but the gospel is still going out. And we read about it, and we participate in it, and then I get reports of things. Stella, several weeks ago, sent me this report about the church that's underground that's exploding in Iran. Exploding! Through what? Big buildings? Awesome worship? No! Underground! By the Spirit of the risen Lord, they are responding under persecution and the word is going out and lives are being changed it's awesome thanks for sharing that article with me i just got so fired up when i read it it was it's amazing how god operates and the choices he makes that are always perfect so you are part of his perfect plan not just that you would be saved and blessed but that you would be now engaged to help save I love this. You'll become fishers of men. Well, Jack will get excited. He, he likes to fish. I had never really fished in my life, but I get the concept. You're out there working hard to throw a line in the water and wait till somebody bites and you reel them in. You reel them in. And that's what they're doing. And that's what they started doing. And even very shortly after this, God Christ commissioned them to go out two by two to share the good news and to heal, and to do other remarkable things. He started getting them engaged right away. But in this first moment, we're focusing simply on the fact that they are part of God's plan, and it's specific, and involve these individuals. And as far as we know, there's nothing other uh, so special about them. God knew, though, that they would be faithful to Him in carrying out this plan and setting aside their lives as previously scheduled to go and follow Christ. Come and follow me. Jesus today is saying to many who don't know him, come, just come, follow me. It's all right here. I've got eternity for you. And I will take care of you today and tomorrow and I will keep you engaged and I will give you a purpose that you never knew you had. And for all of us who have Christ, we know this and it's remarkable. Fishers of men. We all are supposed to be fishers of men at this point. And that's how God has purpose for us. 
to respond to the call on our lives, just like these disciples responded at once to follow him, to learn of him, and then to become more like him through the power of the Holy Spirit and to do extraordinary things, extraordinary things. The third point this morning is that the third thing that we see Jesus doing right at the beginning of his earthly ministry is he starts to heal the sick. It's not recorded before that. Maybe there had been healings before when he was a young boy or a teenager. I don't know. We don't know. But what we know is what's recorded. And at that time, at that appointed time, as he goes to preach and share the good news, as he's out there to call his disciples and form his team that then are going to be able to help him to leverage and get the message out and carry out God's plan for all of us, um, the other thing he does is he goes throughout Galilee. Look at verse 423. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. This is actually our key verse for today that was highlighted earlier. I didn't read it, but it was highlighted on the screen. Jesus went throughout Galilee, first through this area of Galilee. It's a pretty big area, but not all of Israel. Teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. The healing speaks to God in His compassion. Christ came and He knew and He encountered people who were ill. And when He encountered them, you often read in Scripture, you actually read these words, His compassion welled up within Him and He healed. Some came to ask. They didn't just show up and they weren't just in trouble. They actually came to ask. They knew he had the authority and the power to do it, and they'd ask, and he would say, yes, I'm willing. And, and he healed, and he healed again. The healing is significant in its own right because it's further evidence that Jesus is this, and, and God, the Father, is this all-loving God. He has tremendous compassion for his creation, tremendous. So much that he would send his son to die on the cross for us. But when he encounters the sickness, he's there and he heals. So it's really profound that he did that. And it's miraculous that he did that. And because of that, it also did really one really important thing. It authenticated Jesus for who others would like us would, would learn and, and come to know him to be. Because he is the healer. He has all power and all authority. So the healings were there to authenticate the message of Christ. And they were there to authenticate Christ. Even later on in scripture, when there's healings that we read about in scripture. With the apostles and others. There was always a really important purpose in it. It was to bring glory to Jesus Christ. It wasn't just to heal somebody which is huge, but it was also to bring glory to Christ and authenticate and let people know, pointing to the Lord, who's responsible for the healing? Who's responsible for the compassion? Who's responsible for all of this unconditional love that we experience? It's God himself. It's Jesus Christ in person who reached out to heal and heal and heal again. It's beautiful. And so because of that, news about him spread all over Syria. So this, again, isn't just Israel. News starts spreading. You got somebody preaching and teaching with authority. Mark 1.22 says the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not like one who was a teacher of the law. <laughs> There's a pretty you know, interesting comparison there. They had a lot of teachers, but this guy's different. He's teaching with power and authority, and now he's healing. That's going to get a lot of attention. And it surely did. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, dot, 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 and he healed them. Praise God. Matthew 4.25 says large crowds from Galilee 
the Decapolis, this ten city area, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. This wasn't a couple of people. These were big crowds, as you can imagine, because they wanted to come and they wanted to be healed or their loved ones to be healed. We'll read a lot more about this as we get further into the Gospel account. But these crowds started forming and people were coming literally from all over, as you might suspect. But it's beautiful to see how God purposed that what Jesus would do would be to go throughout Galilee first, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, teaching with all power and authority, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. These were the three things in addition to calling and starting to form his team of disciples who were privileged to get to know him and to walk with him and to live with him and to learn from him and to see his glory, in some cases, and his power firsthand. And because of that, and the fact that they were also witnesses to his death and his resurrection, they went on to become the founders, really, of the Christian church. God used them in such a mighty way. What if you had the chance, 2,000 years ago, and you were called. Would you go at once? I'd like to say, yes, I'd go. Of course I'd go. But then you'd be a disciple. You'd be an apostle. But in this season, 2,000 years later, he's come into your life and my life and all of our lives to know Christ. And he called us and asked us to follow him. The same thing. And we responded, yes. We need you. You're a Savior. You're our Lord, so we will follow you. And we will share the gospel. And we will live according to your precepts. And we will bless others, thinking of others before ourselves. And yes, we will turn the other cheek. And yes, so many yeses in Scripture to the beauty and the wonderful values of Jesus Christ that he started preaching about and teaching about 2,000 years ago. So that's our message for this morning. Let's close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for your scripture and how rich it is and to know these details of Christ's life and how he was oriented and what he did and what his priorities were and the impact that he had because of how he was living his life perfectly in obedience to you, Father, but with power and authority. We are blessed to know this Help us to continue to be engaged in this season the way others have been engaged. The disciples, yes. The apostles, yes. And many throughout the centuries and many today along with us. Help us to be fully engaged in fulfilling your plan, which is to continue to reach the world around us and to share the gospel and to share the love and the light of Jesus Christ. We're honored to do it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.